Welcome everybody, Senate Education, May 5th, 2020. Corey Parent apparently has a incredibly <laughs> funny story. So go ahead, Corey. Well, we, we were just talking about swapping talent and fitting a hole not being the most talented, but uh, I went to college with a kid who made it to the NHL and he just made it as the fighter on the team, but he won a Stanley Cup and made a ton of money and he hardly ever played in a hockey game, but it, he got his face beat in a few times and he gets a Stanley Cup and all the money. So it goes to show there's slots on teams, not necessarily about talent level. So Ruth, you were the fighter that they wanted on the one team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's right. I, I'm the fighter, but then you got the you got the slot. You're gonna get the Stanley Cup, and I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna get your face face. Yeah, back. I'll, I'll get my face. <laughs> that's great. I hope not. Okay, if if anybody uh, from outside the legislature is watching, you might be wondering what what are we talking about? We are we're talking about two committees that have been created within the last few days by the Senate President Pro Tem. One, to look at how we transition back into a normal um, services delivery model for uh, government writ large, so including education. And the other for what are the lessons learned from the pandemic? Are there things that we can be doing uh, better next time because of our experience here? So, um, I had started that, uh, that little discussion by asking Ruth which one she was on. Uh, so Ruth, is there anybody else on our committee on that new committee with you? The Transitions Committee, uh, Senator McNeil and Senator Ingram and I are all on that one. Okay, and then Corey and Andrew are on the other one. Correct. Okay, so I, I am not, I have to say 100% clear on how these committees are operating, what their what their function is, what they do. Not with the their, only one. <laughs> I was wondering that myself. <laughs> yeah, what they do with their work product. Um, is it meant to? I think maybe Chris Bray asked this in the All Senate call. Are they meant to pitch ideas to committees of jurisdiction, or are committees of jurisdiction passing things to them for a report? So all of that will become a little clearer, but I did want to start. We, we have that language that we asked Abby to produce on the tax credit, but I want to hold that discussion for a little bit. And I want to instead start with, um, with the email that we got from Brian Campion and Rich Westman. And I'll just, I'll read you the relevant part of it so you don't have to work uh, bringing it up. Wait, I don't think I got that email. Oh. I didn't either. Oh, I'm sorry, It's it was to committee chairs. Oh, okay. So, so I will forward it um, to committee members, but the relevant part is this. It says they've listed four categories to consider and under education it says, what do our pre-K through 12 institutions need as they open next fall? How do we assist our institutions of higher education and guarantee they have strong enrollment and programs? So in other words, going forward, what are our recommendations immediately for um, returning to normal life, robust life, including things like enrollment, um, child care, uh, et cetera, and so on. So what, what uh, they've asked in this memo is that we give them some feedback by Friday morning so that they can review the list. So first order of business today, um, more or less spitballing from our discussions going back to last year this year and then what we've seen in the pandemic, what, what things come to mind in terms of what we need to make sure we come back to in-person delivery of instruction in K through 12? And what things do we need in terms of higher ed um, that might help them? And I, I'll, I'll start with a suggestion. So, 
this goes back to our discussion last time about the tax credit and um, the fact that parents have been called on to prop up during the pandemic, the childcare system so that it doesn't disappear. And then we have no infrastructure when it's time to go back. So that's been bumpy in this way or that, but in the main, I think it's worked to preserve the system. So if we imagine just for the sake of argument that in a month, let's say June 5th, June 10th, June 15th, the go ahead is given to go back and nobody should mistake that for coming from any place of any intelligence. Hypothetically, if we went back, um, one of the things that I think we should be looking at is making sure we don't need this system again, because this system was a stopgap, given that otherwise the healthcare system or the childcare system would collapse. But I don't wanna in the future depend on parents to pay to prop up a system that they are not using because they have their kids at home. So the reason I bring that up is, let's say kids went back June 10th, and in late August, the governor said, oh my gosh, we've had a spike in cases again. We're gonna to have to have kids go home again. At that point, I don't want parents on the hook a second time around because we have our eyes open now. We know the problem exists and it might exist again. So what I was thinking of is something that I loosely in my mind called a child care stabilization fund so that there's money put aside in the event that we, over the next year, hit the same point again so that the state can pay 100% of the child care or 80% of the child care instead of this 50 50 arrangement that we've been talking about. Um, thoughts on, on that, not necessarily that solution, but that problem. If in fact, we have another stop out of childcare. How should the system maintain going forward? And any just show of hands if you have something to add on that. Debbie. Thanks. Um, well, yeah, I totally agree that we should try to be, you know, look ahead to um, problems that might arise again. I, I mean, I would like though to uh, if the system before the crisis, uh, you know, also was in, inadequate to meet the needs of Vermont families, and we need to put more money in, even in good times, uh, for uh, subsidies for families, but also uh, to to the people who are actually running the childcare facilities and to people who would work in them. To, you know, to get trained. So I don't, you know, I, um, the stabilization fund that you're talking about sounds a little bit like a savings fund for a rainy day, but I, I wonder if it would make sense to put, you know, put active money into the system to, to make these stronger. Yeah. And let's, because I'm not arguing that we shouldn't do that, uh -huh. uh, because I think ideally we would. But let's say we doubled the amount that we're using for the uh, um, the childcare subsidy, um, or or that's never going to happen. But we substantially increased it. Um, we'll still run into the same cliff if parents take their kids home. The question will be: Will the state pay a hundred percent, or will they not? So um, I would be all for increasing the childcare subsidy. The question is, would we, would we put the onus on parents in, in this next go round, if there were one, or the state? And if it's the state, will we have the money unless we've created a fund beforehand in the event that we need it? Does that make sense? Yeah, yes. But I think there's a diff another way to look at it. it. You know, maybe maybe we're 
if if they're in better shape to begin with, they don't have to be shored up so much. You know, like I, I was thinking yeah. about like my own nonprofit. I mean, we're we have raised enough money that we have money. You know, we we can keep going, and we're we're working remotely. I mean, there might be you know an opportunity for some of the people who work for childcare to help parents even if they have their kids at home, it, it, you know, occupy them and expand their thinking, you know, remotely. Um, and that's going on now, I should add. Okay. Um, anyway, I think it just overall, I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I don't know all about the fine points, but I guess I'm just advocating for, you know, making sure that they're in a better position. And I don't know if having the kind of rainy day stabilization fund is, yeah, I just don't want that to take money away from what we yeah. have. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and and I, again, I think the idea of increasing the childcare subsidy is one idea that we should pursue. I'm just thinking in addition to that, if we just bumped it up, you know, realistically, would we bump it up more than 10%? Probably not. If we bumped it up 10% from where it is now, we'd still hit that point in the case of a potential second stop out of childcare, where we would be forced to ask parents to step in even, even after the bump. So I'm thinking of maybe a two pronged thing where we're strengthening the system with more money, but we're, we're creating some kind of fund that we can draw on over the next year so that in the event, and what we could say is, if that fund isn't used in the next year, then we use it for a further increase mm -hmm. of childcare later on. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't see, was it Ruth or Andy? I'll take uh, let's Andy. go Ruth, Ruth and Andy. Okay, um, uh, I guess I would look at this sort of a combination of the, what you're both saying. Um, because I think if you look at what's happening right now with the stabilization program, the state money that's going into it that is helping that is both helping stabilize the programs and helping parents pay less are the two programs that we already have in place. One being the um, child care subsidy program that Senator Ingram mentioned, and the other is the pre-K money. Act 166 money. So students who are the four and five-year-olds who get that funding right now, their parents are paying the difference between tuition, subtracting out the pre-K money. And so their, their co-pays are like 10 bucks a week um, because of the, the public funding that we've put into the pre-K program under 166 which we all know is imperfect, but it is something, and that's super, super helpful right now to parents yeah. who are able to get that pre-K funding. And then similarly, the parents who are getting the stable, the subsidy payments that, that Senator Ingram mentioned, they're paying less or nothing if they're full subsidy. So I think that the idea that Senator Ingram is talking about, about increasing those subsidies or even increasing the Act 166 payments does sort of both what you're saying, Senator Baruth, mm -hmm. and what uh, Debbie, sorry, I don't know whether we should be using first names or formal names. What Debbie is saying about the um, the, uh, the the sort of ongoing stabilization, so that I think we could sort of do both by putting money into to pre K and to the subsidies. It is doing, it is helping parents to not have to pay as much during times of closure. So that's one point I wanted to make, and the second point I wanted it's, to make. It's means tested, though, right? Um, the, the subsidies are means tested, but we could change the means for which they're mm -hmm. tested, you know, make it increasing the, the income level so that it is, we did that a little bit last session, I believe, and we could do it even higher. So it, it, it captures more parents, mm -hmm. more families. Um, so I think that's one idea and then fewer parents would have to pay more. And then the, the act 166, the pre-K payments are not means tested. Those mm -hmm. are any four and five year olds who are in that program uh, that are go that are you know through a public school or partner. Yeah. But that's that's 10 hours, right? It is only 10 hours, but yeah. though that sub that payment right now is continuing to be paid even though schools are closed. Mm -hmm. So those four and five year olds 
they are get they are able to maintain their spaces in the private programs and in the public programs without having to pay the full tuition. So in many cases, for example, one of my child care providers, the one who testified on last week, Otter Creek Child Care Center, I think that the subsidy, that the amount that parents are paying if they have the 166 payment is like 10 bucks a week. Yep. So, you know, it's really a small amount because we have funded the Act 166 pre-K. Mm -hmm. So that I think gets to Debbie's point and to your point about parents paying less if we put more into the system, we the state. Um, but another point I wanted to make in terms of the sort of short-term transition of going potentially opening and closing based on what's happening with COVID is that um, child care centers are gonna probably have to work with much lower ratios in order to maintain the small groups. And so I just was reading a letter that I got from one of my child care or the Addison County child care providers. And they are predicting that they'll have to, they'll have to work with much smaller numbers of student of children, higher numbers of staff, and therefore they're going to continue to need the child care stabilization payments, even when they reopen, because they're going to have fewer kids and they're mm -hmm. all going to be you know, so therefore fewer, uh, f f less revenue, um, less tuition and, or potentially needing to open extra spaces or something like that in order to accommodate the same number of kids because of the smaller group sizes they're gonna need in order to maintain the health and safety requirements. So even when they reopen, they're not, they are gonna continue to need these stabilization payments to stay solvent. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, Andrew. Yeah, I was gonna say some of the same things that Senator Hardy just said, but I think there it is smart to think about doing this, doing a kind of stabilization or a crisis COVID stabilization funds differently. Cause basically because of the crisis in the short time we used the CSFAP money and the, the preschool money to help do things that they weren't designed to do. And that works. And so I agree that if we just increase those, that could help carry us through another time. But it might, there, I think it's worth thinking about, is that the best way of doing it? Uh, can we still do that, as you said, and but at the same time, put some money aside and maybe there's even just around the federal rules around the, mm -hmm. the federal money, maybe it's better to do that where we say, instead of paying it through the system that pays the, for the family's care or the family's costs for the care of the children, where we just do block grants to the child care centers or to the preschools, mm -hmm. does that make more sense? So that, I think it's worth thinking about, mm -hmm. uh, is there a better way of doing it? And then it's, instead of kind of forcing these other programs to do something they, they weren't really designed to do. Yeah. That's my thing. Yeah, actually I, I started thinking about this when Jane Kitchell in one of our calls said something about, um, or it might've been in the chair's call, something about in thinking about the $1.2 billion, she's already got in her mind that we'll put some of it aside for needs in the coming year, um, which sounds to me like she's thinking about mini rainy day funds that will be targeted to acceptable uses but that will be saved. Um, and so maybe this could just be considered as a decision that the appropriations committee would make in the event of a second wave of the pandemic and the shutdown of childcare, there has to be a certain amount. Could it be done in one of these ways? And we might suggest several ways for them to think about, but the overriding idea being that we don't want parents to need to carry the system again. Um, so, um, so I'm making notes and what I'll do is I'll, I'll create an answer to Senators Campion and Westman and I'll send it also to you all so that you can see what I, what I send to them. It'll just be the fruit of whatever this discussion turns up today. Debbie. 
If I could just make one other comment, I've um, been thinking about this as well. We, you know, we've been um, continuing to focus on childcare as if, you know, families only have like, you know, kids that are like zero to five, you know, but a lot of families, you know, also have, you know, kids that are older um, and that need, you know, activities and, and things. And so I think, you know, that, and we were working on that after school you know, program that the governor was keen on, you know, anyway, um, I think, I think we need to think in terms of, you know, what, you know, what can also be provided for um, the slightly older kids through the after school programs as well. And I think they've, you know, faced financial difficulties. During this okay, time. let's, you know, let's shift to K through 12. Um, and start with after school. So we, we had that task force which is, I believe, now sitting in the House. I don't think they voted on it. Um, you know, that was, that was a kind of slow timeline. So that could continue to run its course, assuming that the House ultimately passes it. What about, so you would be proposing something more immediate for after school, Debbie? Yeah, I think looking at, you know, we had all these geographic gaps and, um, you know, so I think relieving some of the families without any recourse, you know, to have help with their kids. And, um, and then some of the existing ones, I'm sure, have faced some financial hardship, just, mm -hmm. you know, child care centers for younger kids have yeah. to look into, into that. And, and if we're going to do some kind of stabilization program, we, I think we should do include after school programs. Okay. How about um, K through 12 classroom delivery proper or transportation or food service? Any, any ideas come to mind about immediately what they'll need in terms of boost in funding or programming? Uh, Ruth. Um. Uh, just one comment on what Debbie just said about after school programs. One of the things that I noted during this is that the program, the schools that had already ready made after school programs that are, were school run were the ones that were able to set up essential child care programs more, most quickly because they sort of already mm -hmm. had a model. So that was, I, but I don't think now is the time to be creating new programs. So mm -hmm. I, I would just caution on the after school thing that we don't want to be forcing schools to pr create new programs during this time. Um, but in terms of the other stuff that you just asked about, Phil, the, the, the things that I've thought of that I've heard from people just across the board, and this is true for early childhood, K-12 and higher education, is assurances that they're going to have the PPE they need. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of concern. I've heard this from, you know, all the way from the early childhood little tiny child care centers up through Middlebury College. They're just really worried that if something happens, they won't have PPE. So just making sure that educational institutions have what they need. And the same goes for cleaning supplies and cleaning supplies that are appropriate for, for small kids, like excessive use of bleach for little, you know, around little children is not healthy. So making sure that they have appropriate and uh, safe cleaning supplies, especially since everybody's cleaning so much. Mm -hmm. And then on a broader level, um, there's a lot of concern about kids coming back to any of these programs at any age and having, having to deal with a lot of mental health and trauma issues. Mm -hmm. um, so having increased supports and uh, funding for those kinds of services, mental health, trauma related. Um, and this goes for kids and people who already had trauma but also now who are newly traumatized because of this situation. Um, just, you know, as an example, I've heard about a student who had seven family members die um, mm -hmm. from COVID in, who's a college student from the New York City area. And that person is gonna come back and be super traumatized from this. So just having, making sure that students who are coming from all over the place to colleges but also even young children here in Vermont who, who this has been really horrible for. So um, yeah, trauma and mental health. Mm -hmm. Okay, make, make sense and it dovetails with pushes that were going on before the, the pandemic 
it was reaching a kind of epidemic proportion just in terms of ACEs itself. So to add this on top, I think that's a good lookout. Um, other thoughts on K through 12? Yeah, Andrew. Yeah, similar. I was gonna talk about the counselors, which goes into what Senator Hardy said about mental health, but special grants to, to deal with those you know, all the children coming in, but I talked to some teachers that haven't been able to really contact some of their kids where they're either because of the internet or there's their, their situation at home. So they might, may or may not be traumatized by it, but they're definitely going to be coming in needing some more support and one-on-one -on -one with, with the school counselors. And so any of those, any extra kind of special accommodation grants, I think will be, will be very helpful for the school. And it reminds me, compensatory education on the special ed side is going to be a big expense, much, much bigger, I think, than normal. Um, so I'm sure Dan French, he's going to speak to us Thursday, by the way, about uh, their plans for reopening, what, what they are looking like. He won't, I think it's... Uh, might be the end of this week or next week that they're going to make some kind of announcements. Um, that's what I'm hearing on the ground, but it would be nice to talk to him before they announce anything, uh, just in case something doesn't sound right. So compensatory education um, and mental health counseling, possibly grants, special grants uh, to go along with that. Yeah, Andrew. In addition, because of the social distancing requirement, they might have to like extend the day, I was thinking. So I wondered if it's going to be more staff somehow. I extend just the day. About what, what do you mean? Day. So there'll be more, more time that you'll need the school open or having staff there. Why would so you need to extend the day? Brainstorming. Well, just because if you have a school and you can't put all the kids in there, if there is social distancing requirements, so you yeah. can't have all the kids in there at the same time. So maybe you would, you would have some kids start at eight and other kids start at ten or something like that. So you're, you're, you're spacing it out. So I don't. I was. I'm just thinking this right now that that mm -hmm. might add costs, but maybe it goes to this special accommodation grants that deal with all these issues, whether they're remedial mm -hmm. education or counseling and mental health, but also it could just be uh, other expenses because they're using their buildings differently. Well, it's a good point. I was talking to somebody at UVM and we were talking about classes opening in the fall. And if you have a lecture class of 75 and they're in a hall for 75 and the seats are right next to one another, Clearly you can't do that under the guidelines everybody's talking about. So it seems pretty obvious that in higher ed, they may have to go to doing two, two flights of students. So if the class meets on Mondays, you might have to have two sessions on Monday rather than one so that there's a seat in between each student, um, which means double the work for the, the instructor so I hear you saying something similar that we might wind right. up having to lengthen the day and do shifts in the building. Yeah, I'm just brainstorming. This is not it came up. It could be for teachers or or just other staff that are in the building and other expenses for the building. It'll be kind of like when ministers have to give two sermons on a Sunday. They just got to do it twice. Well, as Debbie will tell us, ministers are not unionized. Um, <laughs> so not yet. I foresee a big fight there if AOE's solution is to double, in effect, double the number of classes and, and require a longer workday. Because let's say I'm a teacher, I'm uh, upset about going back into a congregate setting at all. And right. now I'm told that in, instead of going from eight to three, I'm gonna have to be there from eight to six right well that's why i thought they wouldn't do that that's why there's an extra expense because you you keep the load on the teachers the same but you have to hire other other teachers or support staff that's going to be you, find, you know i don't know how you find you yeah. know accredited teachers to teach a class but 
maybe there are other expenses that we're not thinking of that I just want to make sure yeah. included Ruth? if they are Ooh. in the building or doing classes differently. Ruth? Yeah, well, just to build on what Andy was saying, um, I think that schools are going to have to have creative scheduling. Um, and it may mean longer school days and accommodating it in some way like that. Or it could be that certain days, some, some grades are in the building and other days, other grades are in the building. So maybe uh, high school grades, which it's easier to do distance education would have some days at home doing distance education. Yeah. And so to that point, we, and this I'm sure will come up in many committees, um, uh, doing something about our horrible broadband in the state and making sure that we're uh, covering the state um, so that it, when we will have to do distance education or Zoom Senate meetings um, in the future, which we probably will have to, that everybody has good internet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the school districts literally have lists of homes that can't get internet at this point. So um, talking to school leaders about where their holes are would probably be a good idea. Yep, yep. And finance is much more active on this front than we are. So I think they already have plans with appropriations for a big chunk of this money to go right into um, that map that you're talking about. Okay, um, so let's shift gears and go to higher ed. So I, I wanna, um, I wanna suggest that the state colleges be at the top of our list. Um, there's already been a broad commitment made in terms of a bridge year. Um, you all got Tim's memo this morning. And if you had a chance to take a look at it, it's still, you know, a little bit vague in its outlines, but but the shape is coming clear. So there's a commitment made that all of the campuses, even the three that were slated for closure, all of them will be delivering services um, in the coming year. So uh, that, according to the state college's estimate, Chancellor Spaulding's estimate, that was $25 million. But Tim made it clear that he and Mitzi have agreed that there should be an independent examination of the finances. And then from that, the trustees and the appropriations committees and the joint fiscal committee will work out the exact funding for the next year. But as a, as a general figure, let's take 25 million um, to the state colleges and that's designed to get us into a place where we can have a larger conversation about what higher ed delivery looks like in the state. UVM, as you remember, has also a $25 million request on the table. Um, if, you, if you remember, their $25 million request includes some things that were on the table beforehand, like there was $2 million for a, um, I'm forgetting what uh, Suresh Garamella called it, but it was an office of community engagement or something like that. And so that was a couple of million dollars. There were a few other things. Um, they had expenses that were um, taken on to move to remote learning. And then they had uh, a decent chunk of money, as I remember, about somewhere between five and seven million dollars to invest in moving to, to the next stage of online delivery. So um, I think their numbers are debatable, um, as are the state colleges. You know, we'll, we won't be in those discussions really because that'll be appropriations, but. That's $50 million right there to those institutions. They've got detailed requests about why they need it, what of it can come out of the federal funding. So 
my suggestion is that we forward both of those requests at 25 million with the caveat that those decisions in the fine grain will be made by those other committees, but that we understand uh, the, the urgency of their need and we, we uh, in general support those um, requests. Does anybody um, not wish to do that? To, to, to go in and try to um, create smaller asks. Yeah, Andrew. Not smaller asks, but I just wanna make sure that we're talking about this is the additional federal money and it's unrelated to their underlying requests for appropriations for the fiscal year. These are in addition to their normal requests. So UVM is still asking for their normal appropriation, which is 42 million. And then this is sits on top of that. State colleges, same. They're asking for their normal appropriation and then saying on top of that, they need this money. Um, so my, my thinking about this is really that there has been a really long standing um, I won't call it a tradition, I'll call it a modus vivendi in the building where the state colleges and UVM have been given roughly um, similar appropriations each year. And that's kind of been the, the rubric. I could see somebody arguing that the state colleges in this instance need more than UVM and that may be the case. I could see UVM arguing that the work they did in terms of helping out with the pandemic was at a greater scale than the state colleges. So my suggestion is since we have a lot on our plate is to forward those detailed requests to those committees with our support, understanding that those committees will winnow them out and do what they do. Um, so I'm not seeing any opposition to that really. Yes, Ruth. Well, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I just have a question. Um, or the the expenses that UVM has for having helped out with the COVID pandemic in this short term, really urgent situation. My understanding is that a lot of those would be reimbursed separate from their right. request, like setting up the gym to be a yeah, trauma center and the and obviously the work that the UVM medical center and hospital did. I think those are already would be reimbursed by the federal money, and that was separate from the twenty five no, million. That no, that's part of the twenty five million. So, uh, so I, in other words, what okay. what they're saying, the twenty five million that they put out was um, was a way of saying when the one two. 1.25 billion comes in, we, we want to make sure that um, whatever can be reimbursed from this list is, and then whatever remains, we still get. Uh, that's the way I read it. So in other words, I don't, we could take the time to look into which are reimbursable and which aren't, but I think it would be a waste of our time because that work will be redone by the money committees and if we thought something was reimbursable and they didn't, their opinion is going to carry the day anyway. So both 25 million numbers contain things that can be reimbursed with federal money and both contain requests that cannot. But I don't think we need to worry about which is which is what I'm saying. Because um, in a way it, it doesn't matter. It's, we could, we could do all the work and put it in different categories, but their, their big block request is still the same. So I think we leave that to the money committees to figure out where the money comes from. What they wanna know from us is do we support these lists? Does that make sense? I guess I would just like to get clarity and I can look in my email. I don't have them pulled mm -hmm. up right now, but the clarity on what those lists were to, as to whether or not I mean, we don't have a specific, well, maybe we do, the well, list there, of state colleges, do we? Uh, yes, in, in uh, I'm trying to think of in what form, um, but 
Jeb did break down. The state colleges was really a, a slightly different thing because that was what we need in order not to go bankrupt. Right. Whereas UVM's is more like, this is reimbursement and looking forward to positioning ourselves stronger going forward. Um, so President Garamella sent Phil Scott a memo, which I believe we all got, um, that laid out the $25 million for UVM. And did you, did you all get that, take a look at that? If not, I will find it and send it out to you. Did Wendy send it to us? I, I remember seeing it. But... Um, I think Wendy did send it to us. And she sent it the day after he testified in our committee. It's Whatever. probably on the committee website. It's probably on our website. Um, and I think um, Jeb's 25 million number is, is equally public at this point in terms of where it will go. But, um, you know, certainly we could, we could have a hearing where we sit with those um, requests and look them over, but they, in my read of them, they all seemed like um, fully understandable investments and expenses. And what we would be saying to the to the committees that go forward with those is that we think UVM and the state colleges are gonna need significant investments up to $25 million each. We support the broad outlines of what they've done. Um, so that's, that's my way of simplifying that aspect of it. Then are there other specific things that we think higher ed might need? Debbie? Uh, where are we with the um, uh, the students' complaints that they didn't get enough reimbursement? Or I was following that in the news for a little while, and then I yeah. There's a there's a class action suit that's been filed on behalf of two students, one a foreign student and one from New York, um, and they are making the argument that they paid for in-person delivery and paid a premium because at this point in time, you can get an online degree if you choose. So they paid an additional, they say, $25,000, $30,000 a year for in-person delivery. They were denied that. So UVM owes them, people have now gotten, I think, $1,000 back, but I think they're arguing for something more in the, in the five digit range uh, as opposed to the four digit range. So do we need to set aside any funds for any of the students or has, has President Garmello said anything about concern, being concerned going forward? Um, I haven't heard any word from them on their stance on that suit. Um, it, it would have to be certified by a judge. If it is certified, then it I think automatically includes everybody who was enrolled. Um, if that suit was successful, you'd have to expect one at the state colleges too, um, because there would be a similar logic if you were signed up for dorm life and in in person instruction. So I don't think we can we can't really read the cards on that one. Um, it's a fair lookout that. UVM might say on down the road, we think we have to settle on this and pay more back. So we're gonna need $5 million more to make us whole. Um, so again, the idea that we would have funds parked somewhere. So maybe I will just make in this note I send to Campion and Westman, maybe I'll just make a note that we're we're assuming that appropriations will be creating some form of rainy day, you know, mini rainy day fund for on down this year for something like that that might come up. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, so um, so I, I, it's a little hard in this format to understand where people are on 
I don't want to move forward with saying the committee supports those $25 million requests if people aren't comfortable with that. So I'm, I'm only going by the fact that nobody's said don't do that, but Ruth then Andrew. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, in general, I'm almost always supportive of funding for higher education. I, I, I can't say that I'm supportive of every single little thing that are in those requests. I remember yeah. that there were certain things that President Garamella had on his list that I thought were more legit than others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that the, the blanket approval of the full package, but mm -hmm. just sort of the general uh, support of you know, we need to be taking care of our institutions of higher education. Mm -hmm. I guess I would put Vermont State Colleges as much more urgent than than UVM at this point, given that they were almost going to close and that we yeah. need to find a longer term solution for them. Um, and, and I would just also mention again the PPE thing, and that's for all institutions of higher education. And I think we need to be careful to include the um, private colleges in that, that they're going to have extra PPE um, needs and might need state assistance in getting that because there's such a shortage nationally. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, as you heard me ask the Depart uh, the Commissioner of Health last Friday about testing, so students coming back to the state for higher education will be considered out of state returning Vermonters and they'll need to be tested and quarantined for hopefully by then only six days, but um, there still will be added costs and uh, uh, you know logistics for that whole procedure at the beginning mm -hmm. of semesters. Um, and my understanding is that the state would be getting federal money to pay for all of that testing, but just making sure we're aware of what the higher education costs for testing and quarantining might mm -hmm. be. They might have additional housing costs because of quarantine measures and also you know, can you have four kids in a in a quad, or will they have to, you know, have additional right. housing costs for that? Um, and I can't remember. There was one other thing I thought of, but now it's escaped me. So we'll come back to you, for Andrew. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a good idea to send that. I just don't want to overstate the case that we did a whole bunch of due diligence or anything on it. There's like, like, yeah, in general these are good things to do these 25 million dollar chunks and it might be more for the state colleges i don't i don't want to yeah. say that we've done enough work to know that that's the right number but yeah this in general i feel comfortable saying that the you know the committee is supportive of these kind of sums of yeah. money for these entities okay what if, what if i do this what if um because i agree with ruth i think state colleges need um prioritization to the extent that there is going to be prioritization, um, because they're facing an existential need, as opposed to uh, a need to become stronger going forward, I think UVM is is still in a strong place. Um, so, what if I make it clear that we um, that that's our first priority, but that we support the range of spending that they've put forward and the kinds of things they've put forward but things that um, are less directly rate related to COVID reimbursement or prepara preparation would be down on our list. So the example that I gave is the $2 million that um, the president of UVM wanted for this, this new office of community was engagement or something like that. Um, that was an idea that he came and sold to us in person prior to the pandemic. Um, so to the extent that the Appropriations Committee sees something like that, that's more general and run of the mill, those would be further down on our priority list. Okay, so with that said, um, other things for higher ed that stand out to you. I thought of my other thing. <laughs> okay, um, student scholarships. Um, we, I think, VSAC has twenty million dollar appropriation, and you know we have very little money, so I have no idea if we have enough money to even put more money into scholarships. But this was something we talked about specific to to 
you know, community colleges earlier, but now just sort of general increasing our commitment to student scholarships across the board, specifically, in my opinion, for students who are going to college here at one of our institutions in state, but um, given that we need to support our in-state institutions. So that would, that would be on my list if we had enough money, I think we need mm -hmm. to support scholarships. Mm -hmm. Corey? Uh, I think not only an investment in state colleges, but I think we need to look for agreements. Um, you know, reach out to me and I for it to you, Senator Bruce. If if we do, if we don't come to a solution and there are college campuses that do close in the state college system, I think we have to have some kind of agreement with tuition or with transfer of credits in place. But I also think um, as part of a recruiting tool, because kids are making these decisions now. That we don't need to put the state colleges in a worse position by having people not commit to the state colleges because they're worried that starting this year, you know, they may only get one year at their institution. We don't think that's the case, but I think we should have something in line that gives a little bit of confidence to those parents and those students who are sending their kids to those institutions that there's going to be a reasonable expectation that they're not going to lose any value for, for going there for at least a year. Good point. I had a, uh, an email from somebody who teaches at Johnson who, uh, it, was, it was a horrible email in many ways. Um, it was very sad, um, but this person's number one request was she took a job five years ago so that when her kid got old enough, they would be able to get free tuition uh, at UVM. And so now if her institution closes with her child just coming up to college age, she's worried that that benefit that she was given when she was hired won't be there for her kid. So grandfathering benefits to a certain extent uh, or recovering benefits is something to be thinking about. Um, so this was a person who was making $40,000 um, and who kept that job, um, even though it was badly paid, uh, as such jobs go, because it included tuition for her kid. Okay, so I think we've got a really good list. Um, and so I will, after we get off this call, I'll put something together for Senators Campion and Westman. Um, those of you who are on that committee will be in the discussion of these lists, so you'll be able to explain what our thinking was. And I will include everybody in the committee on the email that I send to them so that you can all see what went out to that new committee. Um, with that said, we do have Abby Shepard here, and she very, um, uh, very efficiently drafted a tax credit um, draft. So I wanted to make sure we took a look at that. Um, in our discussion just now, we didn't include a tax credit, um, but I would like to continue to think about it. I would also like to hear from JFO what their numbers are on it. Um, Abby, have you heard anything from JFO on the numbers? Sure. So I have spoken to Graham Campbell, who's aware of the proposal, and I believe he is um, looking at an estimate, but I don't, I haven't heard what those numbers would be. Okay. Um, can everybody pull that language up? And we'll, we'll take a look at it. And Abby, if you wouldn't mind walking us through it. Sure. So um, for the record, Abby Shepard, Office of Legislative Counsel, both Jim and Katie McClinn, who are also on, the, on this call, helped me with some of the language, particularly relating to the child care um, pieces and definitions. So just, um, I might defer to them for if you have some questions about child care in particular. So this language um, creates, it's two sections, so it's fairly brief, but it has a lot packed in for the credit structure and who's eligible, what sort of expenses are eligible, um, and really the parameters for uh, who would be able to take the credit. So um, it is a one-time 
tax credit against personal income tax. It's only allowed for uh, this current taxable year, so 2020, which means it would have an impact on fiscal year 21. Um, it's for childcare expenses that are paid during closures due to COVID-19, um, only for those taxpayers um, who were not able to receive childcare because they were not deemed essential workers under the governor's uh, executive order. Um, so I can walk through the first uh, section as two subsections to it. It's um, a qualifying taxpayer of, this, of Vermont shall receive a non-refundable credit in the amount of $500 per child. And it's against Vermont personal income tax for these qualifying childcare expenses. Um, this credit is in addition to um, one of the other Vermont child and dependent care expenses uh, credits, which are based on federal credits. So I can unpack that a little bit. Um, there was, I had discussion with you, um, Chair Baruth, about whether this should be refundable or non-refundable, and that would have a pretty significant impact on the cost of this credit to the state. So this is um, a non-refundable credit, which most credits are, um, because they cost less to the state, which means it can only be used against the taxpayer's liability. So if the taxpayer owes tax, then this would help them. So they would be able to get $500 per child for the qualifying expenses. Um, and then the other two credits that currently exist in Vermont, um, one is non-refundable as well. It's 24% of the federal credit for child and dependent care uh, expenses. There's also a 50% credit also of the federal credit and that credit is refundable. So it's, it operates more like a refund or a benefit. So um, the full amount is actually paid to the taxpayer regardless of whether they owe taxes. And that is called the low income um, child independent care credit. And that has maximums um, for adjusted gross income. So only certain low income Vermonters are eligible. It's 30,000. Um, adjusted gross income for single filers and 40,000 for joint filers. Um, so there are a couple of things I wanted to point out in this section that I had taken the liberty of adding to mm -hmm. give some scope to what, um, how this interacts with these other credits and other childcare uh, tax incentives. First, um, that you could potentially take one of these other credits and this new proposed credit, um, but it would only be allowed for those expenses that are not being claimed for another credit. So you couldn't double dip for the same amount that you've paid. You could only use your expenses for one of these credits, but you would be able to apply multiple credits against your tax liability for 2020. Um, another issue that I wanted to point out is that a lot of, um, parents do the calculation between taking a credit and or to using a, a flexible spending account, mm -hmm. um, which allows automatic deductions from a paycheck on pre-tax dollars. So I did, I did not include any language in this version. There, there's one potential option of saying the, uh, we need to think through how to draft that <laughs> first, um, but how, you could potentially structure if you didn't want to be giving a double benefit on the same expenses. So if, if parents right now are paying for childcare using funds from their flex, flexible spending account, they've already taken the tax benefit of getting those dollars without having tax taken out. So mm -hmm. you could say the amount that um, the taxpayer is saving on their taxes could reduce the amount of their credit of this new credit, for example. That's just one option. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I think I could stop there and take questions. That's just subsection A. I can also move on to subsection B. Questions before we move on from this section. And, and uh, I, I know the committee has different ideas about the tax credit, um, but for right now, just in terms of understanding what's there. Okay. Why don't you keep going, Abby? Okay. Um, in subsection B of section one, this is the definition of both in subdivision one and subdivision two, qualifying childcare expenses and qualifying taxpayers. So this limits who 
who is able to take the credit and for what expenses. So in the first definition of qualifying childcare expenses, um, expenses are required to be a cumulative payment of $500 or more per child paid to a childcare provider or facility um, as defined under Title 33 for childcare services the taxpayer did not receive for the taxpayer's child between March 13th, which was the beginning of the executive order, um, and June 1st, due to a closure related to COVID-19. If the I could just break in there, Abby, um, I did have an email from uh, a childcare provider who objected to the, the phrase childcare services not provided. Mm. And the reason for that is um, that she pointed out that they are still doing things. Um, they're still in touch remotely with some kids um, here and there during the week. They are fitting up their place of business. So they're, they're doing valuable work. I think in terms of this particular piece of language, it's fair to say service is not provided um, because we're, we're reimbursing during this period. Um, I don't think we need to get into the fact that they did provide some, you know, some form of remote delivery to some children. I just want people watching to know that the committee appreciates that work, but here we're just making a kind of technical distinction between when the child was in the daycare center and when the child was in the home. Sorry about that, keep going, Abby. Um, so the next sentence within that subdivision requires um, the amount paid to comply with guidance that's been issued by the Child Development Division, which includes um, having paid an amount equal to or exceeding 50% of the tuition for the particular billing period that the taxpayer would have paid but for the closure. So this adds us, there are two different requirements, well, there are multiple requirements, but two major um, monetary requirements imposed on the expenses, one being the $500 or more paid per child and the 50% or more of tuition paid. So just wanted to mm -hmm. highlight those two. Yep. Um, and then in the subdivision two, uh, qualifying taxpayers, an individual who was not deemed critical, so their employment was not considered um, to fall within the essential worker qualification set out in uh, Addendum 6 to the Governor's Executive Order. Um, so there's that first requirement so that because they did not have access to um, physical child care being provided to their children. Um, and then there's a further qualification that for married filing jointly or surviving spouses, so any joint filers, that they would only receive one credit per child per return. So it wouldn't be a, um, thinking in particular the economic stimulus payments, um, it was considered $1,200 per person or $2,400 for married filing jointly. So this is mm -hmm. more of a per filing group credit. And then section two is the effective dates and it applies um, this, this credit to the entire taxable year of 2020, although it is limited to expenses that were incurred during the closure period. Um, this applies it retroactively so that it applies to tax liabilities within the, the current tax year. So again, that, this would be an impact on um, the budget for fiscal year 21. Okay, great. There's that. Questions for Abby about that? Ruth. You're muted, Ruth. Yeah, sorry, I had <laughs> to move the mouse over to the button. Um, Abby, I just had a question about the, um, the not receiving services and how it interplays with the um, essential childcare because um, there are some essential workers, the, two cases, there are essential workers who have not been able to get childcare because there are not sufficient slots available. This is true in a couple parts of the state, including in Addison County where I am, they just haven't had enough slots. So there are essential workers who are 
not don't get the essential worker child care because there there is not available. Um, and then there are also essential workers who do get the child care, the essential child care provided, and it's paid for by the state, but they are also paying to hold a slot in their normal child care. So they may be sending their kid to an essential child care program, but their regular child care program is closed mm -hmm. and they are paying something to hold that spot. Do you, do you see what I mean? So they might be getting the essential child care and the way it's drafted, I think, would preclude them from getting the tax credit, even though they are paying the payments. Well, so if I understand, Ruth, in both, in only one of those categories is somebody out any money. Is that correct? Well, it, in other words, it, the, the first category, if they couldn't get a slot, um, then, so in, in other words, it seems like the problem would only be to make sure we cover an essential worker who did pay to reserve a slot. Yes, I mean, I, I guess, yes, you're right. In one case, they just didn't get any childcare, even though they were an essential worker, but they still paid to hold a childcare slot. And um, if, they, if they did pay, then they should be covered by this. Correct. And then in the other case, they may have gotten essential childcare, but also paid to, to, to hold a slot. And the way it's drafted yeah. right now, because they got the essential childcare, they wouldn't qualify for the tax credit. I think, I believe, yeah, unless yeah. I'm wrong, Abby, I see you. The, yeah, the way that I've, the way that I drafted it, that I read this was, is it's a fairly hard line around dividing between people deemed to be essential workers and those who aren't. So there could be some massaging of that language to allow those situations where they are paying yeah. And they are also deemed an essential worker, and they are paying extra. Um, yeah, it would it would be supremely unfair <laughs> if they were an essential worker and they paid to hold their slot as well, and this didn't cover them. Um, so, yeah, I, I, if we could add a subdivision there that says, in the instance of someone being an essential worker who still paid more than $500, then they would be included. Um, other, other questions? Yeah, Andrew. Yeah, similar on the child care services, I wonder if we want to reference that same statute, 33-3511, has a definition for child care services, so we don't run into that issue with that. that we all got that email from that provider, That's and I know uh, teachers that are providing services. And so I don't know if if the tax department in implementing this would have to make a determination, but it's clear when you look at the statute definition that it, it's supervision. So the calls or sending packets or things like that wouldn't qualify. So that, that was my only, my question about that wording. Does that make sense, Abby, to add that definition? Yes, I think that could take the appropriate care and supervision for children. Um, I can work with Katie to make sure that makes sense. Okay, great. Senator Ingram. Thank you. Um, so I, this is probably not for Abby, but we, we are going to have joint fiscal talk to us about how much this would cost and are, are we? And then I would also like to know um, if they can tell us how much on average a family would is paying to keep their slot, if there's any way to know, you know, what the variation is. Yeah. Because yeah. the only other, I mean, yeah, so, so there's no distinction. It's just this lump sum, right? So, I mean, that, yeah, that's just another reason why I don't love <laughs> tax credits. Well, you know, there's no differentiation between people who are really struggling to pay and people who, probably is not so, such a hardship on them. You know? Understood. I, I look at what uh, the Appropriations Committee just did on the hazard grants. Very similar lump, lump sums, uh, regardless of people's individual circumstances, because 
you know, trying to fine tune it to that level would um, would take so much uh, so much work, and we're really not covering the whole expense anyway. We're we're saying here's a uh, a modest recompense, um, but yes, JFO is going to get us numbers, and we'll have whoever. Um, who did you say, Abby, was the uh, person at JFO? It's Graham Campbell. Graham Campbell. So um, I'm assuming that they'll be in touch with us when they have those. Do you think that's so? Abby? Yes, sorry. I was nodding, not vigorously. Okay. Yeah. All right, yes. sounds good. Um, and again, I don't, I don't presume that the committee wants to go in this direction. It's an attempt to um, partially redress something that seems um, singular to me. I, I can't think of another instance where we've asked um, private consumers to, to fund an industry and keep it going. I would say if it was a, uh, either this or that, and we could only do some sort of stabilization fund to make sure that parents don't have to do it again or provide this credit, I would go for the stabilization fund uh, or whatever is used to address that potential in the next year that parents might again have to cover the costs. Um, I think that's the more pressing need, but I, I do wanna have this out there as a, as a possibility if we get it into a shape where we can agree on it. Um, any other questions for Abby? Okay, um, Abby, Jim, and Katie, that, that was uh, what I had been hoping you could help us with. So we'll just have a few more minutes of committee discussion. Feel free to um, blip out if you like. Feel free to remain, we always like to see you, um, but we'll, we'll probably just have some general committee discussion uh, for right now. Thanks very much. Okay, committee. Um, so, uh, let's see, is Jim going? <laughs> I just didn't. I was, I just, gonna, I was gonna just take out my video and just stay and listen, but do you, okay. do you, do you hear? We, we always love having you in the room. Jim. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, committee, we're, we're, uh, we're being asked to um, do some general planning now, and we did great work on that today. I'll turn that into the memo we talked about. Um, the other thing is that Tim asked me to come up with a list of what we had going forward that were our priorities as a committee in terms of stuff that we already passed. And he made it clear that he wanted a, a, short, a short list. And so um, I said to him that our, I considered our two priorities to be the things that are on the calendar currently. Um, so that, that would be the, uh, I think there's only two, but that would be the healthcare bargaining language that we worked out and that passed second reading that is sitting on the calendar for third reading. I said to Tim, I thought that made a good transition for emergency COVID stuff into non-COVID stuff because it is healthcare related and there is a certain timeline to it, even though it's not COVID emergency. So moving that to third reading and onto the house and then the reorganization of the state board, which is also on the agenda I did not um, list the miscellaneous bill. Um, the library bill had already gone over. The after school bill had already gone over, but I didn't list the miscellaneous bill because as I thought about it, there didn't seem to be anything in there other than the Act 173 language, which we've done in another form. There didn't seem to be anything in there that couldn't wait until January. Um, any 
any thoughts on that? Does anybody have a piece of it that they think is um, more important than that? So just to remind you, it had Yes, it, please do. I can't remember everything. Well, it had the NCAA language, right? which and there they, was some movement on independent of us. Uh, I sent that um, to Corey. Uh, it had the women's um, menstruation products um, yeah. Yeah. in it. It had the wellness. 73. It had the wellness language. So it was all it was all good stuff. It was all stuff that should be moved forward in its time. It's just that none of that seemed to me to be at the level where we needed to um, have it immediately. The reason why I prioritized the two bills that I did is they were both built on painstakingly wrought agreements between opposed parties. And if I imagine those going on into the next session, those kind of agreements tend to come apart at the seams and all of a sudden one party doesn't like it anymore. Um, so if we are allowed to pursue a couple of non-emergency bills, those seemed like the place to put our energy. Um, Andrew. What happened to the stately language? Oh, that's still in the miscellaneous bill. That's, yeah, that's in the miscellaneous. I just wondered with, with more talk of colleges closing, if there was more importance to having that language or not. I, I don't, I'm not saying there is, but that's the only thing that comes. You know, I, the, the, the stightly language, I, I feel bad calling it that because it started as a, as a joke. It did originally come from, from Susan Stightly. So um, it is truthful in a way, but she has, <laughs> she has made it clear she would like a different path. Um, but what I would say is that what exists now is that AVIC has to have a memorandum of understanding where they um, agree to preserve the records of their members should one go under. What we were gonna add to that was a retroactive piece so that it would be dues paying members going back more than a year so that somebody couldn't drop out just prior to going bankrupt. I don't know that that's gonna be that helpful in this moment. And I think the chances that we get agreement from everybody on, on that language are probably thinner. Um, and we're, we're still in an environment where consensus and near unanimity is gonna be necessary. Right, okay. And there, there was one other, the thing about the school board voting, was that in the miscellaneous too, or is that somewhere else? That has been picked up by the house. Okay. Um, because if you remember, that was Martha Heath's um, language from Westford. And Martha Heath, long time, much beloved house member. So um, not okay. surprisingly, it's, it's resurfaced in another bill in the house. Okay. I, don't, I don't know yet what their priorities are or what they plan to send us. But theoretically, Kate and I will have a conversation once she's picked her one or two bills mm -hmm. and she understands what our one or two bills are, we'll have a conversation about how easily we can just concur uh, with one another. Maybe that we can, maybe that we can. And one, it's, this isn't a bill for, uh, that we pass for a priority, but the issue of, of the budgets that those, whatever, 18 districts that don't have budgets. I know we have our proposal in the house is dealing with it, but I don't know if that if that, those kind of bills are added to this kind of list that Tim asked for, is that, if that's a different thing? Well, so, so that's already pre-prioritized because okay. we already have permission from the Rules Committee to vote that out. Okay. It's just that the House adopted a much more generous version right. than I've told them we could do. So I, I told them that what we can do is much better than what's in statute now, and we can't add an inflator and we're not going to empower those districts to spend whatever they want. So um, that's where it sits. My, my, my feeling is that they would be wise to recognize that it's a distinct improvement. If they do and they signal that they can go with it, then 
we can very quickly have a meeting, vote it out, and get it over to them. Okay. So, Corey and then Debbie. I don't think they're going to feel that way. I was talking to a colleague yeah. in the house, Ed, and they 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 think our proposal is unfair to those districts. And you, you know, you know what's really unfair is what's there without our proposal. Yeah, they I just, agree. And and I think the you know the the other piece it was a comment that I heard in that meeting from someone was well we can't put it out to the voters because they want pass budgets in this environment. So I think it shows the strength of our position that we do realize that a level funding is probably, I, I think, I don't think voters would pass level funded budgets maybe in some of these districts. So I think it's, it's the most fair option, but um, I just so, think we may want, I, I don't know if what I wanted to avoid though on this is we get to like June 16th and we're trying to jam something through is, and, and I'm sticking to our guns, but is there a way Tim can talk to Mitzi or, you know, let them know that the Senate is kind of stuck on this. Cause I just think, I think, I don't think Kate, I won't say anything. I don't think they understand the seriousness that we're still gonna have to talk about with the Ed fund when it comes to funding the rest of it. Yeah. And I think they're going to get caught in this small fight. I mean, the colleague that I was just telling me, they were told that our plan saves the Ed fund $13 million their plan would increase the Ed Fund 2 million. So it's like a 15 to $17 million yeah. Delta at a time when we are $200 million short. So it's, I don't, if they're arguing over that 17 million, I think they're getting a lot, they're not seeing the forest or the trees through the forest and understanding where we are. Well, um, two things. So on the chair's call uh, yesterday morning, I think um, we talked about this, Tim, Tim asked, me to clarify the differences between the committees and all of the chairs unanimously supported our position um, very strongly. Had we not been on YouTube, it would have been very, very strongly um, in terms of the language used. So um, the, the general feeling among that group of the Senate was that going, making an end run around the voters to spend more on the Ed Fund this time around is just a non-starter. The, the second thing I'll say is we, at one point we were the committee of awkward metaphors and I wanna, I wanna just go back to that. So it's like there's a, a storm, <laughs> it's like there's a storm of rocks and the default language says that you get a beret to wear to protect yourself. Our language says you get a hard hat and the house is saying, no, we wanna build uh, a, a structure over you. And we say we can't afford to build the structure, but the hard hat's a lot better than the beret. That's kind of how I look at it. Um, so I, all kidding aside, I, I think after a while they'll realize that all we're doing is making a much more generous default than currently exists. And what we're offering is the last contact with the voters. So what we're saying is we're gonna use the last budget that your voters saw, even though it was for last year. And that's better than having the voters have no participation at all. The, the legislature inflating at a level we think or allowing their boards to spend whatever they want. So I think that ours is fiscally responsible and uh, fundamentally more democratic than what they're offering. So. That's, that's all I can say. Ruth. Yeah, I just want to add that um, based on my off the record conversations with a couple House members, I think there's more support over there for our proposal than maybe they're willing to say right now. Um, there are members who think our proposal is the way to go. And I, um, in when I was explaining it to a couple people, they particularly liked the fact that it was bipartisan and that Senator Parent and I were the two that, you know, made the pitch for it to begin with, you know. So, you know, if Corey and I can agree on it, everyone should be able to agree on it, right? So I think that, I think that they'll come around eventually. We just, um, you know, uh, maybe need a little patience right now, but, um, but I, I do think ours is the stronger proposal and everybody yeah. will 
see that whether they want to or not. It's not like we don't want to give school districts the budgets they need during a crisis. It's just that there's some reasonable measures that need to be taken on the in the big picture of our state finances. Yeah. Debbie, did you have your hand up? Did, yeah, I, yeah, I wanted to change, change the subject, but I don't know where there will be room for this or if there will be room for this in this session, this legislative session. Uh, but, you know, are, is there any uh, talk of, um, you know, trying to analyze where we've seen gaps in our systems because of this crisis and then really trying to uh, look at long, you know, long-term solutions in the way that we, you know, maybe changing sort of the way we, we do things. I don't know if the, the are the task forces supposed to do, do that because yeah, the, the one is, one is okay, and not the one that I'm on. I think is that right? right. <laughs> okay, because you know my my universal school meals bill. You know, I mean, essentially that's what the schools are doing now. Is they're paying, you know, they're yeah. finding breakfast and lunch for every single kid in their district. And that was exactly what that bill, you know, says. So we can do it in a, when we decide that, you know, this is the thing to do, um, you know, why can't we do, you know, why can't we really seriously consider it, you know, moving forward? Um, but well, apparently people could get swapped back and forth on these committees. So maybe you should, I should look at getting switched. For a, <laughs> that's right. I'm, I, I bat left-handed. Is that good? I, I... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're we're at time, and um, I thought this was really productive today. So you can look for that memo from me some point this afternoon, the one going to Campion and uh, and Westman, and uh, there was a suggestion in Tim's memo this morning that appropriations and ed have a joint meeting later in the week i haven't had a chance to speak to jane about that so i don't i don't know if that was just a a, a casual suggestion or if there's some thinking there but i'll i'll let you know otherwise two o'clock on thursday and president garamella won't join us uh i'm sorry uh dan french won't join us until 2.30. So from 2 to 2.30, we'll have a discussion maybe of um, one of your committees is meeting today, right? One of is meeting this afternoon? So maybe no, we can- No, they, they changed it. We're meeting at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Okay, well, in other words, one. at least one of the committees will have had a meeting. So maybe we can get a readout about what that's looking like. Uh, general discussion, then we'll pick up with Dan French. So um, be thinking about questions you might wanna to pose to him about the, the reopening, not just when, but, but how, what is their thinking on social distancing? How does that interface with, for instance, the union contract, et cetera. Um, and I will, if not before, see you two o'clock on Thursday. Have a great day. Thank you.